Hello, welcome to this first formal webinar out of a series of four which we are going to conduct during 2023. My name is Willem Bermanje and I will be your host for the next hour. If you've joined, you're in the company of some 260 people from all over the globe and we invite you to comment, we invite you to ask questions. You can do that after the two presentations by using the chat and I will bring your, uh, your questions to our two uh, presenters. We have today in Eindhoven, Christoph Breck from Raw Color, a co-founder of the company with um, clients like Adidas, Ikea and Quadrat. They are located in Eindhoven, the design capital of the Netherlands, you might say so, with the famous Dutch Design Week and the Design Academy located in that same city. Various museums have their work and in a minute I will join Christoph and, and he will explain a little bit more about what raw color is all, is, is all about. The second guest is familiar to me and familiar to a number of you is Thomas Erlings, who is an independent product and interior designer and a senior designer in our final uh, product uh, division. Um, Thomas will talk about something which we at Forbo are used to, which is our trend report, which is looking at what's going to happen in the building and construction industry that affects or that is the result of the trends that we see happening around us. So let's move to our studio in Eindhoven, where you will see a new image if you are familiar to these webinars, which is uh, Christoph in the pink shirt and which is Thomas in the uh, yellow jersey. And uh, the two of them uh, are together in one studio, which makes the imagery a little bit easier and a little bit easier on the eye, on the eye for today because we don't have to switch to all the different, uh, to all the different frames. Uh, Christoph, as a guest, I would like to invite you to start your presentation in a minute. But first, one question. Raw color, what is it all about? Is it a multidisciplinary design agency or how would you describe it? Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Willem, for the introduction. Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, what you said, uh, it's a design studio, design agency. Uh, we are in total five people and uh, we work very interdisciplinary. And I think I will show in the presentation a bit more into depth what the disciplines are and, and give some examples. That's very good. That. Okay. Shall we start straight away? I know both yeah. of your presentations are packed with images. Uh, yeah. Take your time. It's, it's nice to look at and very interesting to, uh, to see what you have to say about what's happening around us today. So welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, let's start with the studio in general. As you, as you know, raw color is the name and, and color is really the core of our practice. And from there, we depart in several disciplines such as product design, photography and graphic design. And here you can see a few examples of those. And uh, I, I, for, for us, color is always a beautiful thing because it's uh, such a universal visual tool that really helps us to travel in, in such a wide uh, spectrum of, of work fields. Um, yeah, to, to show a bit also about, uh, well, next to the, to the frame you see now on the presentation, this is uh, some other parts of the studio. Here you see also Daniela Tahar, she's the, the co-founder um, of the studio together with me. The studio exists 15 years now and um, um, yeah, and you, you see a bit here the surroundings, of course, we, we work a lot of digital, but also for us, it's very important to have physical samples around colors, uh, objects, uh, whatever. So you see a bit in the, in the wall behind. And um, yeah, here is some further uh, impressions of how it is uh, in, the, in the studio to, to work. So working with color, it's our daily activity to do that digital as well as physical. Um, so this would be the, the first project I would like to show. And um, so maybe also good to mention next to, to the client work uh, that Willem already introduced, we also uh, work quite regularly on self-initiated projects. And uh, Temperature Textiles is the project that we see. This is the, the one I would like to start with. And it's a, a project we have set up in the COVID period. And... Um, for us, it's also been really important because we work also a lot in the field of branding and a lot in the field of textile. 
And we were wondering uh, during our discussions with the team during lunch break, of course, we are all very busy with the, the changing climate situation on the planet. Uh, but um, so we we're thinking in our work, can that get a spot? And um, so in the project temperature textiles, we decided to combine those two things. So it's basically a collection of textiles um, that has a generative design approach. So the, the, the textile patterns that you see are coming from climate change data. And um, it's produced uh, with knitting uh, in the very local um, production facility of the textile museum called Textile Lab. I will also share a few more images on there. Um, maybe let's let's jump to the next. Um, so here you see a, a flat knitting machine. It's at the textile lab. Uh, here we were able to work with nine colors and maybe also something to say about this color scheme because uh, climate change is such a, a big and wide topic. I mean, we, are, uh, we can find lots and lots of data. Uh, so we decided on three uh, main chapters, which is sea level rise. That's what we see here. So here we also chose for uh, a, a cool color scheme that really underlines the message. Um, then we have uh, the temperature rise, which has which we use warm colors, and we have emission, which is a mix of both. And a bit about uh, the technique of flat knitting. Um, we also thought uh, it's a, a very sustainable technique in a sense that you don't have any waste uh, of the production. So if you compare it with the weaving loom, you always have to use the width of the total weaving loom. While if you have a flat knitting machine, you can define uh, if you just want to knit a piece of 10 centimeters, that's really just what comes out of the machine. Uh, the edges are already finished and you don't need any extra uh, uh, confection work afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's a bit uh, maybe about this technique. We had quite some talks also about the material use when we, when we defined this collection that we were thinking of, uh, well, how, how can we do it in the most sustainable way? So with the yarn advisor that uh, is working at the, the textile lab, um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, if we should we use a bio-based material like wool or about uh, polyester. And what came to me uh, quite uh, prominent that there is not a black or white solution. So for example, what she advised, um, wool is of course bio-based, but you can only recycle it three times. It's organic fiber. So the each time you shred it, the, the, the fiber gets shorter and shorter. And uh, polyester, you can recycle basically endlessly because you can always melt and extrude it. So that's also the, the question, what's best suitable for your project? And I mean, um, what, what for us was an important conclusion in, in the technique of flat knitting, we could go for 100% of one material. So we tried to avoid a blend of several ones. So what you see here on the left, it's a sample of 100% merino wool. And that's how we also uh, made the flat knit piece. This is a, a different uh, piece of the sea level uh, chapter. It's the round knitting. It's a different knitting technique. And um, so uh, I will also show later another flat knit example. Um, so where flat knit is talking about a future modulation of what's happening on the climate change level. This is, uh, a, so to say, a dashboard of data of the, the current situation of the past. For example, you see these green blocks there in the middle, the square. So this shows the local sea level rise around the globe. So basically what you see on the top, it's north, on the bottom, it's south, left, it's west and right is east. So the sea level is not rising on uh, in the same amount everywhere. So that has influence on gravity, uh, probably on ice mass that's closer to it. So, so, there so there's so much data around and, 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 and also that was the, the beauty that we could work with it and to really uh, dive deeper. Um, also, what was important for us to have it on textile, because textile is some, something that's so close to our body. And there was also the, the, the quote for us when we worked on it. So uh, dress warm to keep the earth cool. And I think it's, of course, even more uh, prominent now with the, with the gas and energy crisis that we're facing at the moment. And on the left, you see the sea level socks. So also there we tried to, by wearing it to, to to really give you the awareness on your body. So you see that uh, light green lines on the socks. So this is the predicted sea level rise. So the most toppest line that's, that's in the most ideal emission scenario, let's say if everything is cut down according to Paris Climate Agreement, we will face 22 centimeters of sea level rise anyhow. 
And uh, as I said, this is the most ideal 2050. So this is the only data that we could fit on a sock. So basically everything else uh, would have been much higher. You would have need pants to get that climate data onto that. Um, yeah, to, to go to the next chapter, this is the uh, temperature rise. I already talked a little bit about the, the, the round knitting technique. I will show a bit more images after that. So here again, you see a dashboard uh, on, on the bottom. You see also temperature rises, also not uh, uniform on the globe. It's in different situations. Uh, for example, in Europe, there's already a much higher climate uh, rise. We already uh, crossed the two degrees uh, border and compared, for example, in place in South America is just half a degree. So that's really also depending locally. Um, of course, color selection already mentioned been a major thing always in our project. So here we were looking at the available yarns in the textile lab, making these wraps to kind of uh, define our palette. And here you see um, uh, a detail of the round knitting machine, also called circular knitting. So it, it, it kind of is a machine that turns around and around. And what's uh, beautiful about this technique, you can really work uh, with embossing effects. So you get these high differences of the textile when you bind the foreground layer with the background. That's what you see here on the on the detail photo of the on the right. It gives a bit the impression of that. Um, and um, yeah, here the the flat knit piece of the uh, temperature rise. And um, it's a bit hard to see, but you, you see each, each, each uh, let's say each color field, it's a modulation from the most ideal scenario. That's the light uh, pink on the, on the right towards the least ideal one. And it goes from 2000 to 2100. So you see the temperature rising and the, the horizontal white lines, that's the temperature. So the toppest one is four degrees. So you see uh, in each scenario with more and more emission, we go closer and closer to four degrees. Um, that, which is also getting a bit more in detail here on the, the temperature scarf. So there we also see uh, each line is uh, representing the year that you see here and the, the three, it's uh, the degrees that's also displayed uh, here on the side. And the latest is the, or the last piece is the emission. I already talked a little bit about that. And um, I also want to invite you, if you have time after the presentation, have a look at temperaturetextiles.nl. Um, there's a whole website that has been developed specifically for the project because it's such a global issue. We, we wanted to reach also the people that are not close to Eindhoven or that, that can touch the pieces. So you will find lots of interactive graphics, videos, live uh, data, and uh, you can see all the details. And also the, the techniques are explained on the website, temperaturetexas.nl. Um, another project, um, this has been a collaboration with the company Sankal. It's a Spanish uh, furniture manufacturer. And um, here you see uh, actually a very first start of the project. Uh, as mentioned before, next to working digital, we, we find it also important to be hands-on. And those were the very first models that we have been making. Um, it's, uh, it's a poof it's, uh, that you see here, link. So it's a poof that's a bit based on uh, uh, the chain principle. And here we were looking about uh, what's, what's the ideal shape and ideal scenario. And then later it was passed on to Sankal. They are based in, in Spain. It's a family owned company. It's just taken over by the two, two daughters. And here you see the, the first prototype making um, next to the link that we see on the right. For example, there was a decision uh, do we show or hide the zipper? And on the left, you see for the sofa loop, you see the first detail, how they would solve the upholstery and the shaping. And uh, that resulted uh, into an exhibition that we hosted uh, just in October here at our studio. And uh, yeah, you see some of the final pieces of the, the loop sofa that people are sitting on. And I'll just go to the next slide. So here you see them a bit better, um, the loop piece and the, the, the detail of the, the chain of the link. So um, so for us, it was very important that the, piece, uh, the pieces feel very comfortable, that they have a very gentle approach. So there are no hard corners that you can find, which is very common for upholstered furniture that uh, it's a bit boxy or squarey often. So we really wanted to have this uh, very soft appearance. And um, also that gives really a modulation of uh, light and shadow, which also has an influence obviously on color. And uh, when we start such a project, uh, we never start from a functional point of view. It's always the image, huh? the, 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 how do you see the color? How do you feel the color? 
And for example, on link that you see on the right in the blue scheme, it's nice that you have, can have this sequence of every individual chain link um, to uh, yeah, make this composition. Um, what was also important for us, and it's probably also things that you will also see later back in the trend report, mm -hmm. that it's a, a combination of a physical space with uh, digital spaces. So again, like the website and temperature text us, not everybody is able to visit. And um, having the furniture in the digital space allows us to do different things. So when you go on our website, you can also see this animation. So the, the detail of the, the sofa, it's, it's moving here, the proportion are changing. So in the digital space, we can do different things and we can imagine a piece in a different way than how it is in, in the physical surrounding. Here you see some more of the setting, the multicolor link and uh, another one of loop. And I think what which was also getting very uh, often as a feedback when we had visitors coming by, that people been been really happy about the, the, the working of the space. So people got really immersed in the color. So I also believe in, in the current period that, that we live, that, that we see it globally, that color becomes very important, huh? that, that it increases our well-being, it gives us the feeling of, of being safe or, or of uh, having a quiet surrounding. So that's something that we got a lot back from the visitors and the exhibition. Here you see another digital translation of the link piece. So these flying segments that, of course, wouldn't be possible uh, when you have gravity. Um, another important part of the exhibition were the backdrops, the curtains, and that's a project we have developed with a Dutch company called Ecological Textiles. And um, this, this curtain are totally bio-based, so the material is 100% wool. And uh, the dyes that you see here, you see the, the pink and the green. So the pink is meadow root, which is a, a, a dried root that gives red pigment, and it's used in a very low quantity. So you get this light pink. And on the right, you see the this green shade, which is an over dye of the blue. It's a kind of European indigo, woad, they call it, uh, with the yellow pigment called reseda. And when you do this over dye, you get this green. I'll just show you on the next slide. So there are two photos, it's the red pigment, this, this dried uh, root, the, the meta root, and um, the vote on the left. So the leaves are used here to, to get to the blue pigment. So also there, that, that yeah, the interaction of these solid colors of the furniture pieces with uh, the translucent shades. And um, maybe talking about the development of colors, Holland's Licht is uh, the next project I want to talk about. It's a lighting company. Um, next to the graphic design in the art direction. They also have asked us to develop uh, the color palette for their product range. And Holland's Licht refers to the golden age of the Dutch painting. So we're also thinking that the color palette should actually be based physically also on the pigments that have been available in that period. So that's what you see here, a lot of these pigment tryouts. So we've been really working here in our studio um, with the organic and the mineral dyes that were available in these centuries ago. And of course, that had an influence, these really bright uh, yellow pigments that were just not there, not available. And um, here on the top, you see uh, the, the zinc white, the burnt umber, the, the normal umber and the ultramarine. These pigments have been mixed to create this really light muted uh, green that we see on the, on the bottom. And that resulted in a palette of 12 shades that you see here. Um, these also have been applied on components of the luminaires. So to also really see how's the modulation of the color, if you have a square or round volume, small or big. And um, this is, has been the presentation in Milan during the stand of uh, Holland's Licht, which we also did the art direction for. So there you see the whole, whole story from the pigments uh, to the color swatches to the final objects. And also here, I want to invite you to have a look at our website. There you will also see much more content like videos that, that shows the process. And here again, the translation that, that becomes a universal um, expression from print to stand to product that it's a, a consistent story from color and the, also the general um, expression. I'm just looking at it's 20, 20 past, are we? Still find us the last one. I think that will that will take less than five minutes. Um, I think for for us is also important to show because we're talking about local local uh, production is something we always want to embrace. 
So these are glass pieces that are developed in Leerdam, a local glass museum, and the last remaining glass blower on that scale in the Netherlands. Um, we have been able to work there. And of course, uh, if we talk about color and glass, it's a feast for the eye. If you come there, you have this whole wall of all the colors, opaque and translucent, then you can select. And uh, that's what we did. And when you see glass, it's it want to take naturally this bubble like balloon like shape that you see already in the color examples and um, we decided to uh, yeah we've been inspired from the balloon here you see the the glass blowing process the ovens and when they are blowing the pieces and um, so it's, it's really super skilled craftsmen that have years of experience that they can make these pieces so for, for us it's also been really important to embrace that that we can do these things and can really it's very direct you can talk with them you can see what's happening we are actually there when they blow the piece when we develop the prototypes and it's not that we just sent them a drawing and here you see the two pieces uh, of globo the, the the cooler color scheme with the lilac and the green and the warm with the pink and the rust red and here you see them uh, when they are glowing, when the light is coming through. So it's op it's an opaque glass and the light source is in the bottom. So the whole object uh, glows. And that uh, brings me to the last slide. So again, the, the website I was referring to there, you can see an overview of our projects and the most recent news you will find our, on our Instagram and social media. Um, that's it. It's a very beautiful presentation. I must also say uh, a very impressive range of colors. Um, I, I, I wonder if we are going to see them back into interiors, into flooring, into uh, our houses. Uh, it's certainly something that I recognize as I'm moving house and you visit all the websites and you see that. But what I want to get back to first is the socks. Where can I buy them? <laughs> yeah, you can buy them on our web shop. I didn't mention that. Ah, and, and okay, that's, that's good. Because... Um, <clears throat> Oh, sorry, just to add, 10% um, of everything, of each sale from this project temperature textiles that goes to Trees for All, which is an mm -hmm. NGO that are planting uh, trees. So we thought uh, then we can actively help to bind uh, CO2. Yeah, very good. It's actually a very nice concept. I remember that in the running up to the um, World Championship football, there was one soccer team, I think Australia or New Zealand or wherever, who also had their jerseys. Um, with, with prints that signaled uh, climate change and that signaled, um, let's say, um, everything that had to do with the uh, warming up of uh, the earth. So um, doing something with your clothes and doing something with what you, what you make, signaling what is happening around us, I think is very, is very impressive. I'm sure we will come back to that theme a little bit later when we will have the discussion. I would like to move to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, um, of course, like I said, uh, independent product designer, senior designer at our, at our vinyl works um, in uh, Koevoorden. But also, you are working together with another colleague of ours, Marijke Gefjoen, on the trend report. And um, I know it started a number of years ago. How long have you been doing this already? Well, I think Marijke already works on the trend, uh, trend reports for maybe 15 years. Yeah. Correct? yeah. And I started it for about 10 years ago. Go. And okay. since that time, we've uh, uh, worked uh, very intensely together on these uh, projects. Mm -hmm. And of course, you publish them now almost every year, yeah. uh, around this time of the year. Um, let's 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 simply go and take a look. I know that you cannot cover the whole report, but you're going to take those extracts that you uh, think are most interesting for this webinar. Correct? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about this visual first that we uh, made for this uh, trend report. So we uh, recreated sort of a combination with all of uh, elements that are in the report. So we will recognize them later in the presentation. Um, well, as Willem uh, said, we will do a part of the report in this presentation. Uh, the report consists of six chapters, uh, and today we will uh, elaborate on three. Uh, the magic circle through the looking glass and regarding nature and the other three I will just show you the summary um, so you will get a glimpse of it but uh, uh, th th we will also do another presentation for the full report we'll come back to that later as well 
So the name of the report is uh, A World of Fluid uh, Fluidity. Uh, this, we chose this name because we see a lot uh, of fluidity between uh, different uh, concepts. So uh, we see a little uh, difference between uh, reality and virtual, but also historical and contemporary, uh, and all these things mixed together. But we will uh, come back to this in the presentation as well. Uh, I will start the presentation with the first chapter called the Magic Circle. Uh, this is something that we saw a lot in different exhibitions. We, Marijke and I, but also uh, members from the Forbo design team, visit all kinds of fairs. Um, sometimes it's, uh, a, it's a furniture fair like the Salone, but also the Biennale in Venice, uh, which is more art. Um, and uh, the Magic Circle, we saw a lot of portals, and the portals, they uh, brought you somewhere else. It's really an immersive uh, experience. And we see also a lot of combinations between historical and modern. Um, and uh, this uh, first slide is a very beautiful example of that. This was a presentation of Kohler in the Salon de Mobile. And you can see this sort of modern structure in this reflecting pool, uh, a, a gateway also where you could enter the presentation itself. Uh, but it really brought you from this uh, classic palazzo into a sort of a modern, uh, space. And here we see another example, the, 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 the right image is the same as we saw before, but now you can see the scale a little bit with the people in it. And uh, Lea Keramice, which is another uh, ceramic uh, um, producer, had more or less the same concept, but on a smaller scale, but also in a very beautiful classical garden of a monastery in uh, Milan. And this is a, a project that's still being worked on. So these are the visuals. Uh, this is by uh, Kengo Kuma, a Japanese architect. And uh, this cathedral in Angers, uh, they made an extra or a, a sort of an extra portal. So they created an extension of the entrance uh, and it really created a sort of an in-between space between the modern and the classical. And also, again, sort of this immersive experience. So you prolong the entrance to the church, which we thought was really beautiful. Well, this is a little bit closer to flooring projects. This is a product by uh, the, the company is called Carpets for Buildings. And they developed uh, a computer pro program with AI, which creates uh, a visual that can be printed on a carpet tile by one by one meter and every tile is unique. So here you can also see that there is a sort of a, a merge between the physical and the digital. And uh, we thought this was very beautiful to add to the report as well. Well, this was something that uh, maybe uh, if you haven't visited uh, uh, Milan, you might have seen it uh, online. This is a company called Solid Nature, which collaborated together with uh, OMA Architects and uh, Sabine Marcellus to create a beautiful presentation at the Furniture Fair. Um, here you see uh, a lot of different types of onyx that uh, Solid Nature has, has in their collection. And they also created this archway, which was illuminated and uh, through which you entered the presentation. And then you came in these uh, other spaces. And this on the right is a product by uh, Sabina Marcellus, also using the material of Solid Nature. Uh, and at the left is also a project of OMA Architects, also with this material. This is a project from the Venice uh, Art Biennale, also this year, uh, by a German uh, artist. And she recreated the sort of the scars in the building of the pavilion. And um, uh, the, she showed where the, uh, the doors used to be. And uh, so you could see the, the historical um, sort of archaeological experience within this uh, pavilion. And you can see it also on the next page. Also, uh, pieces of the floor were taken out. And you can really see uh, where uh, the old walls used to be and where the ceiling used to be. So we thought this was really interesting merge between uh, uh, history and the present. This um, is very digital. So this is a collaboration between Moi, a Dutch design brand, and LG. And they created this uh, sort of a portal with digital uh, sort of it's a, a LED screens where uh, all kinds of uh, projects from Moi were uh, projected. And you could also, again, enter the presentation and uh, see the, the physical 
uh, products. You can see it a little bit more close up. And these are two beautiful projects also made in uh, lighting. So the left is Lee Broom. You can see also against a, a kind of a reflecting pool. And on the right is a project we saw at the Dutch Design Week here in Eindhoven. And it's made with uh, digital or 3D printed uh, bioplastics. So it's also sort of recycled material. Well, this is the summary. Uh, you can see that we made a selection of products by four and also colors on the site. Uh, you will be able to download this uh, um, summary uh, later. It's on the website, so I won't go in it too much. I go on to the next chapter, which I will only show the uh, summary. So this is also, we added uh, uh, this project uh, because it's a, uh, so it's a four bow flooring and it's in a classical building, a historical building actually. And uh, it was um, uh, used, uh, well, we thought it was very modern and historic at the same time. So the next chapter is through the looking glass. Sorry, my phone is talking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, I will uh, go into it right away. This is an exhibition we saw uh, by Tim Walker in Rotterdam. Uh, uh, he is a uh, photographer and we really liked his title, Wonderful Things, and also the way it was presented. I have some pictures of the exhibition later on. This is a project by Carol Bale. Bailings, the Dutch designer, she made sort of flowers. And here you can also see that this merging between the digital and the physical, uh, also between uh, craft and uh, digital uh, 3D printing. So it's uh, on the one hand side, it's very handmade and on the other hand side, it's very uh, digital. Here are some images from the Tim Walker ex uh, exposition in, uh, in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, you can see his wonderful images that are really about storytelling and fairy tales. But we also really liked uh, on the left side that the floor and the walls was all printed and you really had this uh, immersive experience with all the senses. Now here is again Moi design, uh, the presentation. Uh, here you can also see printed flooring and also this uh, chair we had it in our last trend report. It was first made digital and then it was uh, developed into a physical product. Here's some more images of Moi. And this was a very interesting uh, uh, exhibition in Milan as well, from the L, the, the decoration magazine. They uh, made a selection of all sort of modern classics, but the, the way they presented it in the interior was very interesting to us with all these reflecting materials and also textiles. Here you see on the left, Missoni. Uh, they had uh, also a very beautiful presentation. And what's important here is that you have all the glossy uh, material. So on the right side on the wall and on the left side on the floor. Um, and I will show you this next image also, also Missoni. Uh, so that's also uh, sort of uh, if, as if you were entering a fairy tale with these big uh, rabbits and also a rainbow on the floor with all the colors that they have in their collection. This is also the Venice Biennale, the Austrian pavilion. Um, this was also a, a stage. It was like entering a, a television set or uh, or even a game. So here uh, you could also imagine that you were somewhere else on a different planet. Also project in Venice presented at the uh, Louis Vuitton found, uh, Foundation, uh, a German artist who printed on a sort of a uh, metallic mesh, which was very beautiful. So here you also see this digital print is very important. Well, the summary, again, we combined some products by Forbau. So we have the Sky, which is a new product in uh, Allura on the right hand side. It's also digital printed. And on the left, we have the furniture our linoleum in a powder color, which we really thought uh, really connected to the, the, the this uh, chapter. So this is the first chapter where I will only show the summaries, looking for light. Um, very short, it's about lightness uh, in design, but also lightness in products. Uh, so for example, we are working on flex products that you can take out. Uh, so it's a temporary installation. Here you see some images that we found. Then there is constructed pattern. Uh, this is really about uh, color combinations and patterns itself. 
what I would like to highlight is the, the picture number one of Martino Gemper. It's a designer that always uh, uses uh, marmoleum for his works. And these are some more projects. So the, the right project is a very beautiful restaurant in Rotterdam. This is also a very fun chapter, Assembled Identities. Um, and we saw a lot of uh, products that sort of have an identity with eyes or that we're moving, but also lots of uh, uh, material combinations that are very inter interesting. And here we see a digital printed terrazzo that we have in the collection. And then this is the last chapter where we'll go more in depth. It's called Regarding Nature. Um, here we see uh, a lot of uh, designers that are working uh, with nature as an inspiration. And for example, this project by Front Design, they really scanned uh, mosses and leaves from nature and also stones. And he made it, they made it into furniture products with uh, more so. Here's some, see some close ups. So it's really close to the real nature. And it's also interesting that it's uh, made with 3D knits and uh, very uh, modern techniques. This is something we saw at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. Um, we wanted to show this because it's has to, in the title of regarding nature. So this is a product that is really regarding you. It's looking back at you. And uh, the designer uh, really painted the, the eyes of the wearer. So that's a very interesting concept. This is from the Venice Biennale on the left. We, we, we saw also very interesting material use. And on the right is a product which is made with uh, our linoleum by Lina Chi. And she wanted to create products uh, with linoleum in a new way. So it's more of a furniture and also the softness is very important. Well, some uh, trend press of a fair presentation from Salone del Mobile. We saw a lot of integration of green on the fair itself, but these two are very interesting because it was sort of a membrane in between. On the right, it's more of a metal mesh, and on the left, it's uh, transparency that uh, made it very beautiful. Some more. This is a, a stand by Catal, uh, designed by Patricia Urquiola. And on the right hand side, we have the uh, Fondazione Prada in Milan, which is also, you can see that they really incorporated green into the architecture. Uh, this is also on the Salon del Mobile, CC Tapie. They have a beautiful range with carpets that also are, are inspired by moss and by uh, colors from nature. And this is two on the left uh, project uh, at Nilufar Depot. Very beautiful ceramics that also have sort of uh, strange shapes that uh, really are uh, uh, reminiscence of things that are in nature. And on the right, we really like these colors and the terracotta um, uh, sculptures. And this is something you see here on the left as well. It's from the Venice Biennale. Also, these textures are very important and the colors. And on the right, we really like this uh, very uh, mono color. So it's on the wall, it's in carpet, so it has a different reflection, but it's all the same color. And it's made by Forma Fantasma. This is a interesting chair uh, by Tom Dixon. Uh, it's called Flame, the series, and it's made from the same material that uh, has been used for tanks and for uh, security safes. And the concept behind is that uh, a chair can survive a thousand years. This is a kitchen. Uh, also, the texture is very important. It's inspired on uh, a kitchen that's found in Pompeii with the same colors and the same materials. A project by Christine Meinersma, who uses uh, uh, the wool uh, from the sheep that are uh, grazing in uh, Rotterdam. And they have uh, 5,000 kilos of wool every year. And she made a beautiful project with carpets and clothing, uh, all from the flock of sheep that uh, are living in the city. This is an interesting project on the right. Uh, for Ueva. They uh, had a, a presentation with all kinds of baskets that were mended in different ways. So it's also about this uh, giving a, a product a second, a second chance or second, second life. And this is by Studio Show Ota. Um, they uh, use wood, but they want to show the imperfections in the wood instead of taking out the imperfections they uh, incorporated it. So it's also 
um, as you see on the left, you can uh, put use it as a, a wardrobe. And then this is the last uh, uh, slide that I have in the presentation. Uh, we wanted to uh, emphasize uh, again on uh, raw color, these beautiful textiles that they uh, made with uh, uh, natural dyes. And it's of course something that we are also uh, in linoleum, we also have the, uh, the natural dye. So that's uh, a connection that we see there. And here we have the summary, of course. Uh, you see the, the product, products and the colors, and here's some projects. So that was it for me. Thank you for listening. Uh, as I said, there are more presentations coming up, uh, one on the 24th of February and two on the 28th. Uh, if you are interested, you can always send us an email and uh, we will invite you to the presentation. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, and of course, we are making a recording of this webinar. And the webinar can be viewed on all of our Forbo Flooring Systems websites worldwide, wherever we are broadcasting at this moment. And then you can relook and re-experience all the trends that Thomas has been talking about and all the, let's say, innovative ways in which products can be used that Christoph has been talking about. Thomas, whenever I see trend uh, presentations, it, it strikes me that there's a lot of 3D objects and there's a lot of interior spaces. And it's, it's, it's of course logical because if you enter a room, you, you go like, this is nice and this is good and this is, there's nobody coming into a room looking at the floor. We at Forbo might actually do that saying, oh, this is a nice floor. Uh, what about the rest? But how does the changes in the environment, all the images that you have shown, how does that reflect to the floor? Is that also in your report? We saw some Im Im images of, of, of Moi, of course, and I saw some other floors as well. But how does the well 3D environment reflect to what's happening to the floor today? Yeah, well, we make the the, the trend report for different reasons. Of course, it's uh, sort of uh, uh, we have to see what colors are uh, being used in the furniture industry. Mm -hmm. Because, as you say, we want to uh, combine uh, that, that the architects can be able to combine uh, their furniture with the flooring. But we see a lot of development in flooring, actually. So, um, uh, as I showed the, the presentation of Moy Design, but also of the Tim Walker exhibition, mm -hmm. lots of digital printing, but yeah. also uh, an emphasis on uh, natural flooring, but also the flexibility of flex products. Mm -hmm. So it's on different levels. It's a color story, pattern story, but also technical. Okay, good. Is that an because, answer to Yes, your yes, yes. That is an answer. And I have a follow-up question as well, because, uh, Christoph, both of you have been talking about, let's say, the physical world and the digital world. Um, how, how do you see the future? How is this going to develop? Is it really going to be that one is going to take over from the other, or is there a sort, sort of merger? Or how do you see that, Christoph? I think it will always be a transition, at least from my point of mm -hmm. view, that we'll have both uh, coexistence of both. <clears throat> but uh, but for us, and I mean also, if we reflect on our climate situation, um, that was something that became also very prominent to to me uh, when we had the first time <coughs> week after COVID, uh, that that we were also saying, okay, please follow our projects also digitally. You mm. don't necessarily need to come or to fly no. here to see it in, yes. in real person. Mm. So for us, it's always an importance that uh, the, the, a project can be followed on both uh, ways. And, and maybe uh, that counts if you, if I look for myself, uh, for example, at design references, there might be so many products, chairs, presentations, whatever I can call, I might have not seen for real. real. That's maybe just 1% and the other 99% I just know from a, representation mm -hmm. of a photo of a video so therefore i, I think it's a, it's a big benefit and it's great that we can reach globally and i also believe uh, that's also what we're experimenting what i showed you with the 3d representation mm -hmm. of the furniture that we can bring things to the digital surrounding that can behave differently than the physical objects and i think that's really exciting and that's what we will see in the, in the next years in the metaverse and yeah. in the digital uh, environments more and more yeah, yeah, I believe Thomas also showed an example of that, of an object that was first digitally mastered and then it was exactly. made into a real product. Yeah, and so I... design, design, uh, design a product for, uh, for the physical world, but it's also available in a metaphor. So that's a mm. very, very interesting concept, yeah. Okay. If, if we look at um, the materials of the future, Christoph, I heard you talking about polyprop, I think, that was for your knitting. 
Um, but you also talked about mellow wood, which is a pure natural uh, product. W what's, what's happening if you look at the future when it comes to materials? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> so it's, it's uh, like uh, probably also similar <clears throat> that, that there would probably be a coexistence and, and I, what, what uh, was important for us when we did it, like we, we used the uh, wool where it was possible mm -hmm. in the knitting process, uh, 100% uh, biomaterial. But in other cases, a polyester might be much more suitable. And if we look into recycling, it's something that can be recycled endlessly. While for wool, you can just do it three times. On the other hand, for wool, you need washing. You need also to ship the material from the source, yes. often it from Australia. I think that was also interesting well, uh, what we saw in uh, Christine Minersma examples of the sheep from Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. so I think we will look much more at local resources, I believe so. Yep. And, uh, I mean, there are a lot of sheep around in the Netherlands, but often yes. it's not used in our clothes. It, it, it's shipped all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I guess that coexistence and more local <clears> materials <throat> is probably going to rise in awareness and applications in the future. Okay. But also think you need to have a good understanding of what it is that you're buying because the wool is okay, but the sheep carrying the wool for their lifetime, eating and, well, doing the things they do all day is not very ecological. Um, we, had a, we had a carpet tile line which was pure wool and it sounded great, it was great for marketing. But then if you look at the CO2 footprint and if you look at how the product really performs against other products which you might think are much more synthetic, um, the balance is, is, is not always um, easy to understand. Because Thomas, right. when it comes to um, all those changes in the, in, um, the type of um, material that we, that we are seeing, is this also happening in floor covering? Do you see new types of material coming in? Well, um, well, things that are very important, I think, uh, are, are lightweight products. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that in ceramic, uh, but also in, in uh, flooring that we make, mm -hmm. uh, Orbo. Uh, flexibility is very, and modularity is very important. Uh, this is also something we have in collections. Uh, we have the Flex products that you can use, uh, that's PVC, which you can use for a, a, a short time and take it out and use it somewhere else uh, but we also have the, the sort of the uh, more uh, sustainable solutions in another way uh, by uh, that we have the linoleum mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are lots of interesting developments uh, but they might not be as visible as you see them in yeah. uh, uh, furniture or textile well I, I, I heard uh, Christo say about polyprop that it can be recycled endlessly in theory if you look at PVC that also, if you use chemical recycling, you will retrieve pure PVC and plasticizer and filler. And the pure yeah. PVC and the plasticizer and the filler, in principle, can be recycled endlessly. We've proven that into pilots. We're now upgrading that into an industrial scale model. But that's the real challenge, to actually see yeah. how the products that we are using, that you are using, can be recycled and reused. Because, <coughs> uh, Christoph, you, you, you talk about um, sustainability and the word sustainable uh, quite a lot. Um, is it because um, it, it has become a given or is it because it's something that you need to express and pressure, put, put, put pressure on that? You have this choice. Yeah, I think we all need to do something, <coughs> right? And uh, of course, it's, it's something that, that used to be normal in the past, but uh, the humanity developed in a way that uh, we not necessarily make things in a, a circular way. So, of, of course, it's challenging and not every product uh, or every project allows us to do so. Or, mm -hmm. uh, and also what you say, it's, I think there are also never black and white answers. <coughs> Lifetime plays an important role. I think also long, longevity, if you think about we have a day bed upstairs that's uh, produced and designed in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It's a Dutch classic and we bought it second hand. It's been re-upholstered. So it's basically now third hand. And when it will ever leave our home, it will probably go into fourth hand into somebody else's place. So there are so many aspects. And I think uh, we always need to look at the context and what we can do and, and what role we can play as designers. Because the companies that you are work for that are, that are, that are your customers, uh, like I said, Adidas, IKEA, uh, Quadrat, the fabric uh, manufacturer, they also, they, they also have sustainability high up on their 
KPI ladder and uh, almost almost shouting it with every with every message. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, for example, when I think about uh, collaboration with IKEA, um, we, we didn't use any plastics in the products. So that was really actually a no-go zone that we should avoid uh, plastic uh -huh. products and, and their things. So they are very aware of it, absolutely. Do you get any limitations, Thomas, when it comes to designing um, our vinyl flooring products? Yes, of course, there are limitations, but I think we're always um, yeah, working with the R&D department. Sometimes we are a little bit too far ahead. We want something too fast mm -hmm. uh, because we also have to uh, take into account all the legislation and things like that. Um, so there are limitations, but at the same time, we're working on, uh, yeah, it sounds a little bit political, but uh, <laughs> very new possibilities. Uh -huh. We have a new digital printer in, uh, in Koevoorde. Yes. It's uh, very high quality. Uh, uh, quite fast for digital printer. So this is something that we really uh, worked a lot with uh, for the last uh, Allura collection. Also, it's more special, uh, so it's possible to make uh, smaller runs of uh, products that are maybe uh, not the, 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 the best selling uh, products, but that really are special for the collection. And this uh, development with the digital printer makes that possible. If you, if you really would think outside raw color or would think outside Forwo, what for you is, let's say, the ultimate goal you would like to achieve when it comes to product design or when it comes to flooring or in a broader sense that you say, um, my company, our company needs to move this way? Um, it's, it's, it's a question to both of you. Um, Christoph, can I ask you to reflect on this? Yeah, I, I think uh, my <coughs> first... Uh reaction would be we always try to to uh, develop self-initiated projects and I, I think in that sense we always i think in, in, i'm not just talking about myself but uh, globally as companies as humans i think sometimes we need to dare more and eh? we need to maybe take bigger steps challenge ourselves and and, and move faster quicker so that, that we really make a make a change and uh, instead of thinking in problems it's always good to think in solutions and uh, i hope we can carry on that that courage in the future and actually we're just uh, working on a strategy for a new project that we will uh, on research that also has to do with uh, with new ways of uh, using energy we will present uh, next year probably but um, yeah so i think that's always a big uh, development for ourselves and i hope uh, that everybody has the mentality to move forward and are there customers that will come along? Are there customers that buy into the concept and really put up the money and then? Yeah, I think it always happens when, when you show to the world what you're doing or what you're into it, uh, there, there comes uh, things in response. So mm -hmm. I, I guess probably the reason also that I'm, that I'm sitting here and talking about the project is probably because there has also been temperature textiles and the, the exhibition at Dutch Design Week. So mm -hmm. those are things that we are initiating yep. and, and, and yeah, that's... How okay. it works probably. And how is that for you, Thomas? Obviously in a different environment, but... Yeah, I agree, I agree with Christoph a lot about uh, that uh, we should dare and uh, be uh, forward thinking also uh, on a design level, that we uh, really have to make products that people love <coughs> for a long time. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and also really take the, the customer serious, I think, because I think... Um, Customers are very smart. They want to know where everything is from, uh, uh, what the materials are, how they can use it. So uh, we should uh, definitely uh, take that into account when we develop products. If it's on a design of our own or uh, um, more of a, um, sorry, I don't have the word, innovation level, mm -hmm. both on, these things are very important for Forbo as a company, I think. Yeah, that's also what I uh, see happening. Uh, we now have a group of young people working for Forbo and when they talk about sustainability they actually say well it's something people should ask for it's 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 not that you should ask for um, whether the color will last or if it's uh, it's it's an on-slip or it, it's it's it, it's a product that is made out of this material or this material but just ask if it is sustainable if the company has a sustainability policy if there's something that will be done with the product at the end, end of its life. This, this end of life scenario, Christoph, is that something that you, are, that you are concerned with in your designs and your products? If I look at the proofs, for instance. 
Yeah, of course, you always think about it. It's a bit what, what Thomas also said. I, I think when we do projects, we, we do it with a lot of care and, and with the best uh, intentions. So to also mm -hmm. design, I think it's always, we also teach at the Design Academy in Eindhoven for many years, and we always tell to our students, if you don't invest love in your project, yes. it, it will not come back. So I, I hope that people will feel this love mm -hmm. and attention. I think the same counts for also collaborators that put also that in it and you do it the best way possible. And I hope that will benefit in a long lifetime and a good material used in a well thought out construction, whatever it takes to, to, to make it as good and as circular yeah. as possible. Okay, good. We've come to the end of our um, one hour program. I would like to thank both of you very much for a very interesting and very inspiring presentation uh, from Raw Color and all the work that you're doing from Forbo with our trend report and all the images that we have shown. Um, both presentations will be uh, visible on our website. Remember also that the trend report will be available a little bit later in the year in a complete format. And um, I would like to thank you again very much for your contribution and lively discussion. I like the format with the two of you sitting there and me, me, me standing <laughs> at the other side. Much, so much more quiet story. than, the, than, the, than the other thing. So um, good. Um, enjoy your afternoon and um, bye bye from uh, Amsterdam to Eindhoven. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for inviting. Bye.